Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I'm here with a very special guest today, uh, Dr. Patrick Steffen uh, from BYU. Um, I met Patrick at uh, the AAPB conference this year. Um, actually got to see a workshop with uh, some of your students and was just uh, really excited to see your work, uh, fascinated with it. And then we were able to connect. And I was like, I got to have Patrick on the show. Uh, so I'm really excited to bring you to our audience um, here. You. But before I dive in and let's get us talking about heart rate variability, I'd love uh, just to kind of give a little bit more formal introduction of yourself, uh, you know, and your work there at BYU. Yeah, um, I have been doing biofeedback. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I've been doing biofeedback since 2012. So the, the director of our clinic decided to buy biofeedback equipment with nobody trained in how to use it. And I thought, well, that looks really cool. I like to do more with that. So I got trained, started going to APB. My original training is a clinical psychologist with a health emphasis. So I've done a lot with CBT and ACT as far yeah. as like stress reduction and psychotherapy go. And I think HRV biofeedback in particular is a great adjunct to psychotherapy, something to integrate into our um, psychotherapeutic approach and also our stress management in general. Absolutely. So, so starting in 2012, started using it, finding ways, how can we integrate in the clinic? How can we integrate it with uh, psychotherapy? And then it's been great since then. And go, like you say, going to APB is a great meeting. Yeah. Get to know Paul Lair and Dick Gewertz there and uh, Fred Schaefer and Don Moss and a lot of other people. So it's been a great experience. All friends of the show. So uh, yeah, we have been really fortunate enough to have some of you all that are really leading uh, the push here. So I would love to talk about that that sort of transition, well, maybe transitions, the the integration may be a better word, of okay. when you started to do biofeedback, uh, it sounds like you were already doing psychotherapy and then integrating that in. And I'd love to just kind of see like how, how that started, is the integration of technology change kind of maybe how you practiced your approach. I'd love to kind of hear that experience of, hey, somebody bought this expensive piece of equipment. Uh, somebody's got to use it. So let's throw it, uh, Patrick in there to figure this out. I'd love to, like, how has it informed your work since uh, you first got your hands on that machine? I think it's important to start with a uh, a grounding in that we are both mind and body and that our our minds impact our body, of course, but our bodies also impact our minds. So if we learn to become more aware of ourselves, you know, mindfulness is integrated across psychotherapy now. And I think biofeedback similarly adds a lot to learning about what's going on in our bodies and then learning to move towards self-regulation so we can be aware of and then um, change for the better or at least regulate in a positive direction. So we have stress, depression is also related to heart rate variability, more depression, less heart rate variability. I've also seen that with HRV, with anxiety, it's really helpful. A lot of people with anxiety sometimes feel like, oh, people are just trying to say it's all in my head, yeah. but it's really, it's a whole body experience to feel anxious. You know, you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your hands, you feel it everywhere. And I think a lot of uh, clients really appreciate being able to see in real time that there's nothing really just all in your head. There's no magical line at your neck where this is your mind and this is your body. It's all interconnected. Yeah. So if we're having a stress experience or a stress, a really strong stress response, that's going to impact our minds as well as our body. And we're going to start feeling that, that worry, that anxiety. We had a client once that did not want to be in psychotherapy, but they'd been through a million doctors and doctors kept trying to, you know, roundabout tell them, you know, it sounds like anxiety, but they didn't want to hear that. When they saw in real time their physiology and realized, oh, it's not just all in my head, like everyone's just trying to, like, you know, right. indirectly tell them that they're crazy or something, that if they learn to be aware of their physiology and then regulate their physiology, that they can change their anxiety experience. And that was just like, you know, this aha moment for her to say, oh, there's physiologically, there's things I can do that have a, a tremendous impact, not just on my body, but also on my mind. Both both ways. I, lo I love that. So and, and bringing that integration in, like, you know, obviously being there at BYU as well, like, so you got this fancy machine sitting around, you, you jump in, start, start using it. 
I, I, you know, obviously I met some of your students, uh, at yeah. the, the conference. So I'm assuming something, uh, you obviously liked it. Uh, you obviously saw some benefit on it and then kind of, I, I'm just curious how that, that machine started to get other, you know, maybe research going and other things, uh, there that are also, uh, in your orbit. Yeah, one of the, the first studies we did was looking at resonance frequency breathing. Most people, when they do studies, will pick about six breaths per minute. Mm -hmm. So instead of identifying their, their exact resonance frequency, which could be anywhere from, like, say, 4.5 breaths per minute to 7, 7.5 breaths per minute, most people just pick, like, six because it's yeah. simple. And it takes, like, you know, 20, 30 minutes to identify someone's exact resonance breath. So we wanted to see if... If we have people breathe at their resonance breath versus breathing at the resonance breath plus one breath, which means they're going to be off mm -hmm. from what the yeah. resonance is. So we had them practice that. Then we had them do some simple math stressors and then a recovery period. And we found that people, when they're breathing at their resonance frequency, they did better in response to the math stressor. Physiologically, they didn't respond as much. They recovered more quickly. So we found that there, you know, there's benefit to the, the you know, resonance breath, the resonance frequency breathing to take time to learn to do that. So that was one of the first things we did. And two of two of my students at that time have now moved to the counseling center at BYU that works directly with the students. And they run a they've created within the counseling center there a biofeedback lab, like a stress management biofeedback lab where they teach people um, some basic HRV and teach them how to use the equipment. And then they allow students to come in on their own and use it you know they have like those different games that you yeah. can play where you can uh, learn to regulate physiology as you play games how cool that, that that's amazing so i wonder like as you introduce this to your students and obviously they they kind of got the bug as well uh with this too i it's sort of I, i'm wondering kind of the as, as they maybe a lot of them hadn't heard about heart rate variability how how is it like to for them to sort of uh, include that as part of their learning experience uh, as students? I think the the younger generations, like, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm an older, I am definitely <laughs> an older person now. The younger students, the clinical psychology students, I think it just makes sense to them to think of mind body as being interconnected and it's important to treat the whole person, yeah. to, work, to work with the whole person. And so for a lot of them, they just clicks immediately and they're like, oh yeah, this is great. And they want to learn how to do it. Um, we're also working with uh, Michael Larson, who's a neuropsychologist, and two of his students are looking at HRV biofeedback, one with uh, post-concussion or TBI. Oh, cool. Uh, Post-TBI patients, or currently have TBI. And another is looking at aging, so looking at people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, looking at HRV and aging, if there's differences. And they're doing a, a brief HRV protocol to see if, if can you change that somewhat there their symptom profile or their experiences by doing some HRV biofeedback. So people that aren't even in neuropsych, you know, I don't usually think of people, you know, they're not usually your biofeedback people because they're much more about assessment. Yeah. About the intervention, but now they're excited. Like, Oh, we can do more than just do assessment in neuropsychology. We can maybe do some interventional things. So Amazing. That's pretty, pretty yeah. Cool. So when you when you look at it just and I may be asking a question that's a little in left field. So if if there's not a really good answer for it, I I'll, I'll accept that as an answer. But I'm interested with like a traumatic brain injury is something that's always uh, been a, a real fascination. I don't know is the right word, but like I, I know that a lot of my work, like in homelessness, uh, addiction, that when you do a thorough assessment, traumatic brain injury pops up yeah. at alarming rates, incarceration. I had a, uh, a friend of mine do a study in a prison that like 90 plus percent had traumatic brain injuries, which I think makes us think about criminal justice a lot different in some ways. And I, so sure. I wonder, you know, do you have a hypothesis at least uh, maybe before you get some data on maybe residence frequency breathing and how it might, I don't know if help traumatic brain injury is the right word, but I, I'd love to maybe get some of the thinking behind that study. Yeah, we don't know if it'll help, but that's why we're doing it. But there's a large research literature out there showing that with traumatic brain injury, that HRV will go down. So this has <laughs> like been known for a while yeah. and there's no intervention. So we're just, you know, dipping our toes in, charting 
new waters here the, to look at, well, maybe HRV biofeedback might be of some help in these situations. That's so hopefully we'll find out. So with, with um, mentioned incarceration and homelessness, with a lot of TBIs, you'll get more impulsive behavior. So your ability to inhibit goes down. Uh, probably also your ability to focus. So that's really important for a lot of aspects of mental life and probably for occupational success is to be able to focus on a task and follow through on a task. And so if you've if your TBI has led to difficulties with mental focus as well as inhibition or impulsivity, those are going to make your life you know that much harder to be able to uh, succeed in whatever area of life you're in. Absolutely. So I wonder, you know, having kind of gotten exposed to this back in 2012, uh, you, you, you beat me by several years uh, with that date. Just kind of wondering, like, it seems like the whole HRV world has, at least in my opinion, like being obsessed with it for about six or seven years, continues to expand. And I, I'd love to sort of get your experience of, hey, somebody bought an expensive machine. What is heart rate variability? Uh, at least that was my initial, like, what is this? Uh, yeah. To to now really an integrated part of your work. Look at like over the last uh, 10, 11 years, uh, how have you seen it sort of grow and expand uh, over that time? Yeah, I think like just going back a little bit in time, like 20, 30 years ago, they started accumulating evidence that HRV is related to like everything. It seems yeah. like <laughs> longevity. It's related to heart disease. It's related to all, and of course, and yeah. depression we mentioned. Um, low HRV is, is seems like it's, it's, it's a marker of how well are we doing in life? Yeah. Kind of general marker of, of general functioning, or I think Julian Thayer called it like a measure of adaptability. Yeah. How well, are we adapt our, maybe our intrinsic capacity to adapt to life situations and stress. And that got me excited. First learning about it, about feedback and then learning about HRV is, I think like you see in this last 10 years, now people are like, well, what can we do? We know this is bad if it's not, if it, we have low HRV. So what can we do about it? And so there's all kinds of things happening now where people are exploring what are the possible interventions. We even see like, I think I find it really intriguing, like wearables, like people that try and measure themselves, um, not just rings and watches, but like they have these shirts that have sensors yeah. in them that they're like, there's, what is that movement called? The quantified self movement where people yeah. are just really intrigued with collecting data about the self. You can store it on your, your watch or I guess through your watch, but onto your cell phone. But there's so many opportunities for increasing awareness of, and then ideally you using this in treatments or interventions or therapies you know, how can we help people? Yeah. And that, that's the exciting, like, like you said, if you put that together with a different understanding of self, like there's, there's a physical reaction, which uh, whether I'm talking about like the neurobiology, you know, what's going on in the brain yeah. with trauma, stress, or the autonomic nervous system, I, there's something freeing about that. Like I call it kind of like trauma and stress literacy. Like how, how do we as professionals understand this enough to help teach others because i've just seen some pretty powerful examples of people's lives changing once they realize okay i'm i'm there's something there and it's not just like hypochondria or making it up or something like that which i think yeah, is like yeah, exactly so a weirdly powerful thing uh in a lot of people's recovery and ability to live a better life as well yeah, I think it gives people hope that, well, there's something that I can do. Because I think a lot of times people get involved with some new thing. Yeah. And you get it a week or two and then you get tired of it. Where like with HRV, within five to 10 weeks, you can start seeing significant effects, but you've got to get to that point. Yes. People have to have that hope. Oh, this is worth investing that time. And then they start seeing, oh, this does make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's like the whole thing with my, so many people I like talked to about mindfulness, like they, they're, I, you know, and as, as a, someone who's not maybe genetically great at it, like this thing, just my brain never stops spinning. Like that there's yeah. not that kind of positive feedback loop, at least initially with folks and to see, to see that, even if it does take a few weeks, but to start to see and feel residence frequency breathing, like there's, I think when we get to that nice mindful state a little bit better with RF breathing and then 
you know, you can start to get data, which uh, can hopefully for a lot of people I know can be really motivating to continue to move forward. Yeah, this reminds me of a, an, an early one of the first studies I did with Michael Larson looking at um, the impact of it was just doing mindfulness audio clips. It was like John Kabat-Zinn doing mindfulness of breath. We wanted to see what are what is the impact of doing a 15 minute mindfulness of breath exercise on physiology, but also on the self report of anxiety and stress. And the interesting thing was we were seeing significant changes in physiology in very little change in self-report at first. So the yeah. body's changing, but the mind's not quite aware of it yet. And so I think that with biofeedback, that's the really important thing is they get that immediate feedback, even if they don't feel like, wow, I feel magically different. Yeah. You can see the body's changing and the body, the heart rate's changing, the, the resonance frequency's changing, or like, I mean, the as they engage in resonance frequency yeah. breathing, you can see that the level of HRV changing. So you have that immediate feedback of the physiology. So even if the mind's not like, well, I don't feel like my anxiety has gone down a hundred percent, you know, this may be a little bit. When they see that, I think that's really reinforcing and gives them the the hope and the the uh, desire to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep up with this because I can see this is really making an impact. And then over time, like for example, we did a study one of my students looking at the people with depression, um, it, le it led to faster change in depression and HRV went way up in the um, the HRV plus psychotherapy group. So the psycho had psychotherapy, psychotherapy plus HRV. And the HRV made a huge difference, not just in increasing the HRV, but also the, the depression improved. Uh, yeah. Improved. Oh, exciting stuff. So when what is like you know and this is what i love about that this field is it's it still feels even though i know hrv has been around for a while it it still feels new and fresh and like it, you, yeah, i think it really is i think in the example of of, of you which i i hope i imagine this will be a compliment to you because i i hope this is said about me but as Dr. Uh, Ina Hazan is, I'm like, I need podcast guests. Uh, your name was right up there with the Lears and others of, of the world that you mentioned. Uh, Thank you. And uh, which is pretty impressive with just 10 years of, of experience. So, you know, I, I kind of wonder what were maybe some of the other insights uh, along the way uh, in your journey as obviously uh, you were having success with it and then to, to continue to grow um, and and become a leader in the field. Uh, what was that kind of maybe some interesting points along that progression for you? Going back to 2012, I, I took the, um, you know, go to APB and they have those workshops. I took yeah. ones with, with Lair and Gewurz. And then I had the next year, I had the opportunity to do a postdoc. So I went to Rutgers with Paul Lair. Oh, how cool. This summer on that. And so it really got me thinking about you know, there's a lot more we could be doing in psychotherapy than what we're doing. Yeah. So thinking about how can we do that in a way that's, um, I guess, simple, because a lot of therapists are like, my life's hectic enough. Yeah, exactly. Throw another thing at me to add into this. So how can we, and I think biofeedback, HRV biofeedback is pretty simple when you get to, yeah. to the root of it and what you're doing. And so thinking of how can we do this in a way that um, engages people and makes it so it's not burdensome but you know useful yeah and, so, and then and then getting involved at APB it's, it's a wonderful place and going to conferences each year yeah you see each other people's presentations and it gets your mind thinking oh that's an interesting way of thinking about it so it's being able to go to conferences like that where you get to get to see you know what are the current things that are happening and what are some cool studies they're going especially like anytime I see Lair Gervertz or Ina Kazan or uh, Schaefer or Don Moss, or the, you know, and there's a yeah. lot more people right out there, and um, to be able to see their stuff, it always gets me thinking. Oh, that 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 could be a, you know, play off that idea or build off of that. There's there's, like you said, that the it's it's all brand new in terms of the interventional stuff. It's like yeah. last ten years is when this is really taking off. Yeah, it's really exciting, and I I always try to plug the both AAPB. I've got my. Uh, I got my journal uh, right here that uh, cool, cool. But most journals I might look at the table of content, but there's always like at least three or four articles, if not more, that uh, are good there. And then I agree with you, like the conference, 
I don't think there's a lot of arenas that you get access to. I can come up and talk to you. I can come up and talk to Moss and like just to be kind of after two years feeling um, accepted. The podcast kind of helps because I get a talk and they get to share their stories with me. But at the same time, it's like so cool to like sit at the feet of y'all and just like be accepted, um, you know, and, and welcomed. Uh, and no question is, I mean, you can add, you've got the world experts in the room, but no question is sort of a dumb question that, that there's like this yeah. beginner's mind that perpetrates throughout the, the conference that I love as well. And the cool thing about it is you've got, you know, there's psychologists like me, but there's also people in exercise, yeah, in sport, there's people in uh, medicine, nursing, and then there's people from all kinds of areas. And then you like some bioengineering people that make the devices. Yeah. So you got all kinds of different people, which makes it really interesting because you get so many different perspectives on on this area. So it makes a lot of fun. Yeah, you really do. And early plug, uh, they're they're coming to my hometown of Denver uh, next oh, yeah. year. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just have everybody stay well. over at my yeah. place. We'll take a we'll take a bus down to the the hotel. But uh, sure, sure. Yeah, excited, uh, excited to host. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get, you know, a lot more because, it, like I said, it's very an accessible group uh, as well. So even if you're new, you you don't necessarily get overwhelmed uh, with mm-hmm. what's there. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just so excited it's coming uh, down the road for me. So yeah, yeah, I like the meetings that are more like you know, a couple hundred people. More yeah. intimate, more conversational, like you say. I went to a I've been to APA APA a couple of times and it's like an ocean of people. Yes. Like, it's just <laughs> overwhelming to find something specific to what I'm interested in. Cause it's there's lots of general stuff, but I like yeah. to really get specific towards stress and health is my research area. So I'm really intrigued by that and looking at that. Yeah. That's one area we'd like to do more of is looking at um uh minority groups. So yeah. Most of the, you know, for a lot of psychology, it's like, it's just the study of white people for a yeah. lot of We're looking at like Hispanics. We looked some, some studies looking at Polynesians in general, looking at HRV, but we want to get into biofeedback. We have, I had one student that um, she was native Spanish speaker and she, part of her PhD, she was working at a Hispanic clinic. And when they brought in biofeedback, the Hispanic people loved it. They were like, oh, this is, this oh, is really so cool. cool. They love the idea. So looking at how do we, you know, it's, it's probably not identical across groups that they're going to see things the same way or the, the approach yeah. is not identical. So how do we make this or set it up in a way that's that's, that's accessible to people across the world? I love that. I love that. So as you look sort of forward, and you know, as, as you look maybe the next five or 10 years, obviously you shared some current interest and studies that you're working on. Where where do you think this will be? Where where are we going with all of this? Because I as HRV kind of it's on more people's watches, it's on their wrists, it's on their arms. Uh, you know, that there, there's you know the Bluetooth sort of movement in there as well. But as heart rate variability gets, I, I don't know, it, mainstream is probably too strong right now, but yeah, yeah. I mean it's more and more people are learning about it. I think really getting excited about it. Uh, Kristen Bell, uh, my wife says, do, do you know Kristen Bell? I don't think my, I think my wife thinks I made up the idea of heart rate variability uh, in a dream. So she's like, Kristen Bell's talking about this now. And I'm like, oh, that's great. So, you know, at least we got one celebrity uh, talking about it on our side. But uh, I just love to, love to get your idea, maybe from academic studies and also just kind of for the general population is that this gets more and more uh, prevalent uh, and the understanding of HRV is is growing fairly rapidly. Yeah, there's two things for the future that I would hope to see, wish to see. One is more integration between for psychotherapists of any stripe to 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 have an easy module or easy way that they can integrate it. You don't have to become an expert at it to like use some basics. Um, Don Moss and I are editing a book for Oxford University Press called integrating psychotherapy and psychophysiology awesome. and we have chapters from paul air and dick Gewertz and Ina kazan as well as people like if you know paul gilbert who's compassion focused therapy he, he yeah 
he created that approach. And we have like Stefan Hoffman looking at uh, different approaches and Tim Smith from the University of Utah. We've got uh, people from all over the world and this will be coming out this fall. So really excited about getting people thinking about how do we bring in psychophysiological approaches like biofeedback. You can even say mindfulness really is in a, in a way it, it elicits a lot of psychophysiological benefits. You'll say mindfulness impacts HRV, mindfulness impacts, they do a lot of neuro or MRI type studies. So it's definitely there. The research is there. Now let's find a way, like you're saying, how do we get this into the mainstream of psychotherapy? How do we get this in the mainstream for people in general? Having famous people doesn't hurt, right? That yeah. People, <laughs> if someone famous is doing it, then they're going to be like, oh, that, that person's doing it. So maybe I'll give it a shot. I'll, you know, check that out. So that, you know, between the, you know, the publications and maybe creating simpler things that people can integrate and then, you know, getting the, the general population as well, the average person access and knowledge. Awesome. Any other uh, uh, points on your journey that, that we haven't covered yet? We've kind of gone in the past, gone in the future, but I don't want to I don't want to end the podcast if we've missed any uh, other gems that uh, might have been uh, lying with, within your experience or interest uh, with this. I think we covered the big ones. I know this is uh, appropriate for a podcast. So I was going to ask you about your journey, but maybe you've already done that in a, in a previous podcast. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll share it here because I, I think that it, uh, it it sort of fits a little bit into to, I think we overlap in uh, a, a pretty meaningful way. So. My work uh, has historically been uh, with trauma, trauma-informed care has been pretty much central to my career ever since I saw the Adverse Childhood Experience Study in around 2003. Yeah. So um, working in child welfare, homelessness, those realms, you know, trauma was always there. We just weren't talking about it. Uh, we were talking about people making bad decisions and there was that behavioral, like I got trained like, Right. Cognitive behavioral therapy was, you know, we could measure it, we could get evidence so that we were moving away from like strict behavioralism into that. Uh, but we weren't talking about trauma. So we were to still talking about like decision makers and punishment rewards and weighing consequences. So, you know, when I started to see the impact of trauma, especially when, you know, going again to our discussion, like how it impacts neurodevelopment. Um and really looking at like brains developing different and all of a sudden the behaviors of the youth and then adults that I'd worked with made a lot more sense. Like it's one thing to think, hey, they're weighing the consequences and the rewards of their behavior and then making a well thought out volitional choice. Um, with the behavioral issues that a lot of my clients had, it was more because of a dysregulated hard. system or a trauma trigger. And so- that that really, as we're talking about, it's like, oh, all of a sudden when I saw this biological injury, um, it, it really like made me think about my work in a total different way. So I, I kind of dedicate myself to, I'm not going to shut up about this until anybody that wants to hear me talk about it will hear me. I didn't necessarily set off to do a lot of trainings and consulting around it, but it kind of evolved in. I guess I talked about it fairly well, at least enough for uh, that to become a good part of my career. Um, but one of my frustrations was I knew there was this disrupted neurobiology. That, that was pretty much a given. Um, however, was the, was the housing programs or my clinical interventions helping to heal that underlying uh, in neural injury? And so you know, while I had a fantasy for about five seconds until I Googled how much it cost about getting a functional MRI into a, a residential yeah. treatment center, uh, that 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 uh, dream died fairly quickly. Um, you know, when I started to learn about polyvagal theory and Stephen Porges's work, um, heart rate variability just came up more and more and more. And, I, you know, initially I got passionate about how it can be an outcome measure and really looking at you know, if we can, now that we've got Bluetooth technology, we can take relatively expensively, inexpensively, you know, uh, daily readings. Uh, we can pre and post test different things. I can 
see what state a client's in before a therapy session. And so yeah. that's sort of where I you know, was looking uh, about three, four years ago for some of the athletic apps out there to uh, say, mm-hmm. do you want to look at mental health? And nobody, you know, it's kind of sexier to have LeBron James on your app than, you know, yeah. folks He's experiencing homelessness. But, uh, you yeah, know, he, I, he uses it, some app, doesn't he? Maybe it was calm. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Um, he's, yeah. He's on Whoop too, so I'm sure uh, man, yeah. takes care takes care of himself. He's a good role model. But so yeah. yeah, that's where it led me to you know eventually that frustration turned into optimal HRV, and then uh, our good friend Ina Hazan. Uh, you know, I, I she's the one person that returned my phone call when I was trying to get somebody to care about homelessness sure. and these and she called me back and i always knew there was the biofeedback side of hrv but i also understood the learning what low frequency and high frequency and very that was like okay sure. i think i know the time domains um i think i know enough to say rmssd is a pretty good metric to use for daily readings but boy do i need to build a whole nother expertise on this and uh, fortunate for me, uh, one of the uh, nicest, kindest, and smartest uh, people in the field uh, joined. And so that's where I really caught the bug for the biofeedback is, in some ways, as a therapist, probably the greatest homework we could give people is helping them establish their RF uh, rate and then uh, having them practice that between between sessions. Like that, that to me is so then working to integrate that into uh, the technology as well has been a long road, but uh, sure, sure. it's been uh, real, like really fruitful. And somewhere <laughs> along the way, I thought, Hey, why don't we do a podcast? Cause nobody's has a heart rate variability podcast. So. Uh, and thinking of poverty, you know, that's, that's, you know, a lifetime of poverty, HRV biofeedback is just going to be like one piece of the puzzle, right? We yes. want a multi-pronged multidisciplinary yeah. approach where this is a piece but, you know, trying to create, um, you know, there's so many different aspects of that. How do we, you know, hit all these different pieces from the, not the psychological and the biological, but the social context. As, Absolutely. As and doing it at a rate, the, the other thing was like, it was, it was hard to afford a lot of the higher end. So that the price point and trying to find an affordable yeah, that's reader true. and, you yeah. know, with accuracy. So that, that took several years as, we went through everything on the market to try to find, you know, something both affordable, but to make sure it's accurate too. So it's, you know, trying to keep that price point low while providing the best possible accuracy as, you know, uh, I've learned a lot um, (laughs) in a very short period of time. And I know uh, uh, I've got a lot more to learn uh, as, as all this great research just seems to be coming out each and every day. Well, it seems like you have a lot of a lot of energy to move forward and focus to get some good things done. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate like you, you and and all. I mean, I know we've thrown a lot of names out there, but it's just like so great to uh, the openness of this community to to talk about your experience, talk about your research, because you know I I don't think there's a lot of conversations going on about this and i know my audience who after i think this will be like episode 117 or 18 like have stuck with us uh through this exploration and uh the numbers keep ticking up so uh you all are both entertaining and brilliant which i appreciate thank you thank you it's been good talking to you yeah well dr stefan i want to thank you for your time and your work um uh, obviously, you're at BYU, BYU. We'll put a little information about you in the show notes. So if people uh, want to learn more about you, they can visit our show notes. But uh, I just want to give you an open invitation. Uh, hey, if you get a juicy piece of research for us, uh, know the door is always open. I'd uh, love to have you back uh, uh, oh, sure. and That'd share more of your journey as it, it plays out. Thank you. That'd be a lot of fun. Thank you. As always, you can find show notes, everything else at OptimalHRV.com, and uh, I will see you next week.